Um, welcome everyone to this week uh, Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have Professor Jana Tumova, who is an associate professor at the School of Electrical and Computer Science at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Um, something about her, so she received a PhD in computer science from uh, Masaryk University, hope I spelled it correctly actually, uh, and uh, she then was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at KTH in 2013. Uh, during this period of hours, she also was a visiting researcher at MIT, Boston University, and the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. So her research interests include formal methods applied to decision making, motion planning, and control for autonomous systems. And uh, among other projects, she is working on compositional planning for multi-agent systems under temporal logic goals, and uh, design of correct by design as socially acceptable autonomous systems. Today, she's gonna to talk about uh, some of her recent work and some, I think, big picture. And we are all very excited about her talk. So, Jana, go ahead, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me. I should mention that uh, those years I spent um, visiting uh, MIT and uh, Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology was actually in Emilio's group, so I'm, Super excited to be here and give the talk to the new generation of Emilio's uh, group. <laughs> uh, so I will be talking about uh, formal methods for preferred motion planning today. And uh, well, let's just begin. Um, I would like to start with talking about formal methods for motion planning in general. Why do we use formal methods? Why it's a good idea to join those two topics? I'm fairly sure that you are familiar with motion planning, uh, with formal methods, maybe some of you are, some of you are a little bit less. So we will just go through that quickly and uh, then we will take a look at formal methods for provably correct motion planning. And from that, we will move on to preferred motion planning. And I will explain what I mean by that, where we get there, but roughly it's uh, motion planning uh, as planning of motion that is um, preferred among other motions. Okay, so why should we look into formal methods for motion planning or what are these formal methods? So formal methods, there are a bunch of different definitions out there. Uh, usually agree on something like formal methods are rigorous techniques for specification, development, verification and analysis of systems. So that kind of gives us an idea of what kind of questions we might want to use with formal methods within robotics, within uh, autonomous systems. So the specification, how do we specify motion planning goals and constraints and development verification analysis that sort of aligns with the question, how do we design plans that uh, provably meet uh, some sort of specification? So, very high level uh, questions that we can align with this is how do we tell autonomous systems what to do or robots what to do and how do we ensure uh, that these autonomous systems or robots behave as expected so that's our ultimate goal with using form methods for robotics or for robot motion planning. Now um, today I will be talking about temporal logics as uh, that way to specify uh, goals, constraints, preferences, uh, and I will be talking about formal synthesis as that tool that will that will provide us these plans. So why those? Why temporal logics and why formal synthesis? So temporal logics are rich, rigorous, but they have some resemblance to natural language. You can take a look at an example. Here I have a robot in an environment. Um, there are multiple rooms, ABC. There are a bunch of trash cans or trees and Wi-Fi routers and things like that. And I might be interested in saying something to the robot, like keep patrolling the three offices. So um, I can encode this in linear temporal logic and say something like uh, always eventually A and always eventually B and always eventually C. And that's telling me rigorously uh, to patrol all these three offices. So when I say always eventually, it really means that I should go there always eventually infinitely many times or patrol those offices. Uh, I can also express uh, conditional things or request response types of properties. Like uh, whenever you spot danger, you go directly to the staircase and then wait for all clear signal before continuing. And then I could have uh, 
LTL formula describing this, saying something like always. And now whenever there is danger, the next step should be staircase and you should stay there until all clear. So the U operator st st uh, stands for until, the X operator stands for next, G is always or globally, and it's telling me whenever there is danger, just go to staircase and wait there until all is clear. So I, I can express such a motion or even task um, goals with, uh, with temporal logic. And I can also equip temporal logic with uh, a concrete, um, with concrete uh, bounds and uh, say things like make sure to recharge at least every 10 minutes. And then my uh, formula, this time it's gonna be metric temporal logic formula will look like always eventually between zero and 10, you should reach charge. So, um, so every 10 uh, minutes, at least you should recharge. And uh, at all times, stay within five meters from the Wi-Fi router. Uh, and then uh, my, uh, in this case, signal temporal logic formula will look like this. Always the distance between the robot and the router should be smaller or equal than five. So I have this rich, uh, rich specification language or a class of specification languages in temporal logics. And that's great because those are rich, rigorous and have some resemblance to natural language. And then formal synthesis, uh, we use formal synthesis as uh, that thing that turns the what, the temporal logic formula into the how, into a plan. Uh, and uh, formal synthesis is nice because it gives us provable guarantees on uh, the synthesized uh, plan or strategy or uh, whatnot. So uh, formal synthesis uh, roughly looks like this. I take my system. It could be uh, my robot in my environment. I take my objective to patrol the offices. I model the system somehow and feed it into the formal synthesis framework. I specify, uh, I specify my objective in a temporal logic specification, feed it into formal synthesis, and then formal synthesis does the job for me, finds the plan. Now the model of the system, I have here kind of two, um, two stage modeling uh, thing, a model and, and an abstraction. So the model here is, uh, by that I usually mean some sort of dynamical system or equation that describes the, the system quite well, but it is typically very hard to work with uh, in con combination with temporal logic specification. So I need to make a simpler model of that model, which I will call abstraction. And that's basically some sort of discrete-ish structure that I can put together with the temporal logic specification and the formal synthesis framework. Now, uh, it is important to understand that formal synthesis is not just a single algorithm, that, it's, uh, um, that it doesn't take one model and one formula, but you can take any model in a particular modeling formalism, any temporal logic specification in, in a particular temporal logic and the formal synthesis, uh, is sort of a framework, you push a button and you get out a correct by design plan, then you can, uh, you can put that back onto your system. And when I say a plan here, uh, it doesn't have to be just a sequence of actions. It could also be a feedback plan or a history dependent plan or, or something similar. Um, so this is how formal synthesis uh, framework roughly looks like. And when I started my PhD in 2009, what we had back then were um, sort of abstractions. Uh, we worked with abstractions that were quite simple in a way. They were deterministic transition system, non-deterministic transition system or patronets and the popular temporal logic specifications back then were linear temporal logic and some uh, fragments of it to make the formal synthesis more efficient like uh, like um, uh, GR1. And then <clears throat> by the time I finished my PhD in 2013, we had a much more interesting system, the systems that we dealt with. Uh, we dealt with multi-agent system, partially unknown and dynamic environments. We worked with much more interesting objectives, temporal logic goals, 
with additional optimization criteria and various deadlines. When it comes to models, we were able to handle nonlinear systems and systems with disturbances and the abstractions uh, that we had were roadmaps created, for instance, from sampling based motion planning algorithms or weighted transition systems, bringing in some quantitative uh, uh, elements or MDPs, bringing in probabilistic uh, viewpoints. We looked into user friendly interfaces uh, that were linguistic or graphical. The temporal logic specification became also uh, probabilistic, that's PCTL probabilistic. Uh, computational tree logic or MTL metric temporal logic to address those aspects of probabilities in MDPs and uh, and explicit quantitative uh, uh, quantitative weights in weighted transition systems, respectively in their original systems, and. Uh, well, when I say we, I mean the community. I don't mean uh, me and my group or or me in particular, I mean the whole community of, of uh, formal methods in robotics or in robot motion planning people. Uh, today, uh, these uh, techniques have matured. They became uh, much more applicable to real systems. Uh, we started using much more complex systems and much more complex models. And we pushed the formal synthesis also a little bit more towards task domain, but also towards control uh, domain. Uh, for instance, with using spatio-temporal goals and constraints uh, on low level, uh, corresponding to temporal logic specification in signal temporal logic, which is a thing that I will be talking mostly about today. Now, um, uh, so far, uh, everything looked uh, nice and neat, and I painted uh, this great picture to you. You get a correct by design plan, and and that sounds amazing. So, what are the challenges? Why cannot we just go ahead and use this on any particular system? Well, there are a couple a couple of obstacles or challenges that come with this uh, framework. One of them is, of course, that the systems are uh, complex; they are uncertain. Sometimes you don't even have a model of your of your system, uh, and uh, then uh, also the systems they don't live in a vacuum. Your robots don't uh, or or autonomous vehicles they interact with other agents on the road. And uh, there was um, one particular thing that I kept secret from you, and that is that very often, more often than you would want it, you get an answer. There is no correct by design plan, uh, and that happens. Um, all the time when your uncertainty is high, um, when you consider systems that interact. And I frequently remember what Emilio told me eight or nine years ago. Uh, so if you want to stay perfectly safe, then the only thing for you to do is stay at home, stay in your garage. And this is really what motivated my research uh, in his group back then and what keeps motivating my research uh, till today. So um, what I present in this talk is sort of uh, built on this heritage. Uh, okay, so uh, what can we do if we, uh, if we have no plan? So I just want to give a little bit of overview that there are different kind of approaches. Uh, so what you can try to do is you can try to fix things. So you can try to fix your robot. You have robots that have non-holonomic constraints. You just replace it with a robot that that has uh, more cap capabilities, and suddenly, uh, maybe what was uh, what you couldn't do before, you can do, or you can try to fix your environment. You can try to uh, you can try to remove some of the the obstacles or things like that. You can try to take a look at the sort of minimal revisions to the environment that you need to do uh, in order to be able to start satisfying the specification. You can fix your model, and there is a rich uh, literature on things like model repair uh, for MDPs and um, and similar, where you, through exploring how the model should change, uh, are in fact exploring how the robot or the environment should change. But by fixing a model, I also mean refinement, for instance. So model is an abstraction of my original system, and when I do abstraction 
I sometimes am conservative in that. Um, maybe if, uh, if my abstraction comes from sampling-based motion planning, I did not do enough samples to find a path. If my model uh, as that abstraction comes from cutting the environment in the grid, maybe my grid was not fine enough. So fixing a model may also mean refining that model uh, so that uh, we start finding plans. Or you can try to look at uh, refining uh, or fixing your specification. And there is also a rich body of literature on that topic. Uh, for instance, uh, in a group of George Feinekos or Demos de Margonas, they looked into the question, if I cannot satisfy this LTL formula, what is a close LTL formula that I can satisfy? And then, uh, then um, you basically synthesize a plan that does something slightly different that you wanted, but it probably does something that is close to what you wanted. And um, I would say that within this line of thinking, um, uh, the approach of coming up with a plan that is as correct as possible fits into these lines as well. So uh, that is, um, that's where I would put the techniques such as, for instance, probabilistic satisfaction guarantees. So if your plan is not fully correct, surely or almost surely, you can still try to find a plan that is uh, correct with 90% uh, probability. Uh, and I would put there also minimum violation planning and risk aware planning. Now, I know that you had a knock Wong Firam Sarn here uh, several months ago talking about minimum violation planning for autonomous driving with traffic rules expressed as uh, temporologic uh, formulas. And uh, I will just briefly sort of introduce or remind you of that concept uh, on a few slides before I proceed to the main topic or main course of this talk, which is uh, the formal methods for preferred motion planning. And we will build there a little bit on this on this minimum evaluation motion planning principles. And that's why I'm going to just give you a peek into that. OK. <clears throat> so minimum violation planning. Uh, well, uh, if I uh, let's take a look at an example. I have a system. It's an autonomous vehicle on the road. I want to drive uh, through a road segment from, from some initial intersection to a final intersection. And uh, there, are, there are road rules or traffic rules that you should obey, like uh, you should not cross a uh, full lane, you should stay in the right lane, you should not en enter a construction zone or a sidewalk. <clears throat> now, if we use the classical formal synthesis framework, we can model that somehow and we can use temporal logic specifications with these particular traffic rules, you can just use LTL linear temporal logic over finite traces that it's going to work out just fine, feed it into control synthesis. And now you're asking the formal synthesis framework, give me a plan that is as correct as possible. So that would be a plan where the traffic rules are violated only for the absolutely necessary time and only when absolutely necessary. And uh, this is uh, this means that you need to have a way to distinguish between violating uh, violating uh, trajectories or violating motion plans and uh, possibly also between satisfying uh, motion plans. So back in 2013, in collaboration with Emilio and uh, his group and Daniela Rus uh, and her group, we uh, proposed quantitative evaluation of uh, linear temporal logic. So now assume that your model is given and you have a transition system either that came either from RP star um, or some kind of other abstraction technique, just a transition system. And then our level of violation will be defined as the time duration associated with the discrete transitions that need to be removed in order to make the trace satisfy the LTL formula, weighted by some sort of penalty that tells you how important uh, that LTL formula is in your structure of traffic rules. <clears throat> in other words, the level of violation is telling you what you have done wrong, what you shouldn't have done, and if you didn't do it, everything would have been all right. 
Um, and with that measure, we were able to, uh, to kind of trick the formal synthesis framework, uh, automata-based formal synthesis framework to give us minimum violating plans instead of provably correct by design plans. So we start with our abstraction, our transition system that is, for instance, coming from our star or somewhere. I have my formulas, uh, my traffic rules. Each of them, uh, each of these formulas, we are going to translate into finite automaton. And now in order to be able to capture this level of violation, we are going to, what we did is that we proposed a way to enhance each of these finite automata with weights. And this was systematically done so that when combined with the abstraction into something that we call weighted product automaton, the shortest accepting run in this weighted product automaton was projecting onto the minimally violating plan provably. So what we have is basically a sequence of lemmas telling us the runs of the product automaton maps to the traces of the transition system, the weights along the run of the product automaton determine the level of violation, and then the shortest run of the product maps onto the minimally violating trace of the model. That's what we wanted. And now, of course, here I assume that I already have the, the abstraction, but uh, we also looked into what happens when I kind of like uh, um, integrate this, this methodology or this procedure into, into directly RRT star while we are building the abstraction, while we are building uh, the RRT star tree, we are um, finding better and better, less and less violating solutions. So from RRT star, we went to minimum violation RRT star instead of weighted tree. We, um, we were working with weighted product automata. Instead of shortest path, we are uh, looking into minimally violating path. And instead of distance being our optimalistic criterion, it was primarily the level of violation and then distance. So this was sort of like a first work in uh, uh, first of our work in, in that area. Um, here you can see how the MVRT star behaves. Um, it, uh, when we give it a road rule, stay in the right lane, do not cross a uh, full lane. Uh, and what you see is that the car goes by the obstacle, but it does not continue on the shortest path towards the goal. It continues on the shortest path that goes back in the right, right lane. So now this video is sort of, <laughs> nostalgic already. Um, it shows uh, uh, the implementation of, of the MVRT star on an autonomous golf cart in Singapore back in 2013, uh, thanks to Emilio's and Daniel's uh, uh, amazing groups. Um, I have continued this line of research with my group. We looked into limited sensing and multi-vehicle settings and, and, uh, and uh, different kind of uncertainties, but that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to move on and start talking about signal temporal logic uh, instead of linear temporal logic. And I will show you why. So LTL is uh, very good for expressing uh, high level goals or or high level semantical dependencies and, and similar things. Like when I want to say keep patrolling three offices, I can express that in LTL, but it, on its own, it does not contain any explicit timing bounds or any explicit uh, bounds on anything else uh, on uh, level of, uh, of battery or on distance to obstacles, on the level of radiation in your environment, nothing like that. Signal temporal logic has a way to do so. So with sim signal temporal logic, we can say things like, uh, make sure to recharge at, at least every 10 minutes. And then we have this operator GF010. So we are parameterizing the eventually uh, operator with zero to 10, 
as in the time when this should happen. But we can also uh, say things like stay within five meters uh, from the Wi-Fi router. And uh, that is done by replacing the classical atomic propositions that are true or false with functions of some signals. So my signal is at this time distance of a robot to a router. And my function is basically uh, uh, function compared comparing to, to zero is basically saying that uh, the distance minus five should be smaller or equal than, uh, than five. So uh, smaller than or equal than zero. So I can combine, um, combine uh, the functions uh, that are now my new atomic propositions and the time bounds as well. And I can come up with the formulas that sort of contain both. And I can say things like within 10 seconds, get at least 10 meters away from, from uh, your initial position. And this will look like, uh, like this. Uh, eventually within zero to 10, the distance of a robot and the initial position should be greater or equal than 10. So that's the benefit of signal temporal logic. It has the explicit bounds, which make, uh, may uh, come up very handy when it comes to autonomous systems, robotics, and, uh, and uh, expressing constraints and uh, preferences. Uh, now, signal temporal logic is also nice in the sense that while we had to come up with a quantitative semantics for LTL, there was nothing like that before. And we had to sort of propose our own one to define what is a minimally violating plan. STL actually comes up very naturally with its own uh, quantitative semantics. It's called robustness. So. Um, there is two types of robustness, uh, time robustness and uh, space robustness. And time robustness is actually right and left time robustness, um, depending on whether you are looking how much you can shift things to future or how much you can shift them in past. I will show you an example here. So I have a formula that says eventually between zero and one, the distance of my... Uh, my um, position to point B should be zero. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that uh, at, between zero to one, I would like to reach point B, right? So when I look at the first trajectory, let's say that the duration of this trajectory is three seconds, clearly does not satisfy the signal temporal logic formula. And what it's actually missing, it's two seconds. So the robustness is negative to indicate that uh, this is not satisfied. And it's minus two because that's exactly what I'm missing to satisfy that formula. For the blue trajectory in the middle, let's say that this took us two seconds to get to B. Again, the formula is not satisfied. And what I'm missing is one second. Uh, that's my robustness, minus one, as in I'm missing one second to be able to, to reach point B in two seconds. And then the third one, let's say that this, uh, this was, um, a B was achieved in 0 0.9 seconds. And then my robustness is 0 0.1 because that's how much slower I could have been. And, uh, and uh, my formula, my original STL formula would still hold true. Uh, so this is, this is time robustness for STL. Then when we look at spatial robustness or space robustness for STL, here I will have a formula that says that always the distance between the trajectory and um, the closest obstacle M should be greater than one. In the green trajectory on the left, this is satisfied and my robustness is 0 0.5 because I could have gone uh, 0 0.5 meters closer to the obstacle and it would still be fine. In the middle one, uh, this is still satisfied and uh, my robustness is 0 0.1, as in I could have gone 0 0.1 closer and I would still be fine. When I look at the third trajectory, the purple one on the right, uh, the distance between the obstacle and the trajectory is 0 0.3 in the worst case. And that means that the formula is not satisfied and my robustness is negative to indicate that it is not satisfied and 0 0.7 because that's much, how much I'm missing. So now you hopefully start seeing the dilemma that I'm having here. Uh, 
things that are fast uh, and satisfy some time properties might not be the things that satisfy uh, the spatial properties we are interested in. And in fact, uh, the time robustness is only, it only makes sense to define it. It's only when well defined if you have fixed spatial robustness. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a little uh, Pareto from there of uh, spatial and time robustness. And now uh, I have here a formula, STL formula that says that I should reach A and B within uh, zero, uh, within one second or one minute, and then I should uh, then I should uh, also keep my distance to obstacles at least zero point seven during the whole trip. That's the big T. There is basically the duration of the of the task. And when I look at it like this, I have options. Right? I can go very fast, and then uh, let's say via the blue trajectory. And then I'm satisfying the time robustness, but my spatial robustness uh, is probably something like minus 0 0.7 because I'm going very, very close to the obstacles. Or uh, maybe um, I'm not so insistent on, on satisfying the 0 0.7. I'm going to be happy with spatial robustness minus 0 0.5. And then I will get something like the green trajectory that is satisfying the the time parts a little bit worse than the green one and uh, and it's sort of a compromise between space and time or i can be very conservative and say i want my spatial robustness to be actually positive not negative and then you given the spatial robustness being positive uh the time robustness will be lower and that's represented by the the red trajectory and the question is which one is more important space or time and which one do you prefer so now we are getting to the preferences a little bit uh, we will start talking about uh, how stl and tuning whether space or time is more uh, more important gives you a way to express preferences and express what you prefer let me ask you here what do you prefer as a human driver? Would you stand in the roundabout and wait for the red car to go? Or would you, uh, would you just go? So same STL formula for these two, prime, uh, for the, these two scenarios um, with different prioritization of the space or time can give you two different trajectories. And that's the point that I will try to make now. So what we did is that we proposed cost function for STL constraints that tries to merge this space and uh, time uh, uh, robustness into one cost function and use some user-defined parameters to say what's more important to a user. Um, so for simplicity, we start with goals in syntactically co-safe uh, LTL, that means that our missions get to be completed in finite time, essentially. And we add some constraints or spatial preferences in a safety fragment of STL. Uh, it's a simplified fragment. It just basically says that at all times something has, has to hold. Um, some more rich fragments are a point of our future work. So for, for now, we are just looking at safety fragments. And uh, my proposed cost function is going to be uh, taking trajectory length and uh, violation cost. So uh, it's going to be important for me how fast gets this co-safe LTL formula satisfied and how much on the way I violate the spatial robustness of my STL uh, safety uh, um, constraint or preference. And then the violation cost was defined as um, integral taking uh, the time duration till the co syntactically co safe LTL formula gets satisfied. And it takes the time robustness uh, times some weight. And that weight is parameterized by A and alpha. 
two user-defined parameters. A is sort of giving you a slope, how fast uh, with, with getting, um, how fast you mind uh, with getting, uh, getting the uh, spatial preferences being violated, how, how bigger deal it is. So, uh, and alpha basically gives you a hard constraint I do not want to go below this threshold. So uh, that's non alpha is sort of like the, the stopping point. It's not negotiable to go below this spatial uh, robustness. And then A tells you the, the is, is essentially a function of the spatial robustness and uh, that, that tells you how, how much you mine with increasing spatial robustness. So now we massaged it all into one cost function. And when we have, when we have one cost function telling us uh, what's, uh, how, how a STL formula gets evaluated, what we can do is what we did for, for minimum evaluation RRT star with LTL specifications. And we can just uh, come up with STL RRT star. We incrementally built a weighted product automaton uh, taking the syntactically co-safe LTL and the safety fragment of STL. We are incrementally updating the minimally violating path and our optimality criterion in this case is the cost function. And what comes out is that when you change, when you play with parameters A and alpha, so here alpha is, is uh, fixed, but when you play with, with parameters A, uh, what you get is different kind of trajectories. So the, the um, what's the color? The green blue one here is a classical RRT star. It goes uh, to um, the top and the bottom region as fast as possible. But we have on top of it, this uh, safety STL constraint or preference that we should stay away 0.5 from obstacles. And uh, then depending on the tuning of parameters A and alpha, you see that some trajectories uh, prefer to do that and stay more away from the obstacles at the cost of being longer. And some trajectories um, are just violating it a little bit more at the cost of completing the task faster. So this is what tuning the A's can do. And uh, this was for a formula that uh, was to, um, to keep things away from obstacles, but we also looked into keeping things close to something when we had uh, this scenario with the wireless signals uh, depicted as this uh, green bubbles. That's uh, the range of my viral signal. And we would like our robot to stay within the range uh, and at the same time avoid the obstacles. And again, different tuning of parameters A led to different kind of trajectories. So now um, when we have an idea how to, um, how to use STL to, to um, express preferred motion or constraints in motion. I will show you where we used it to actually get the uh, improved performance of autonomous exploration. So autonomous exploration is a well-known problem. Um, you put a robot in unknown environment and the goal is to basically build a map or for each of those, uh, those cubes in the environment to say whether it's uh, filled with obstacle or, or not. And uh, there is this uh, autonomous exploration planner that came out of, uh, of a group of one of my colleagues here, Patrick Jensfeld. Um, what they did is basically they looked uh, around with their UAV and then uh, used RT star to go to the point that gave the best information gain. So it was information greedy algorithm sending the UAV always via the shortest path to the, to the point where it could learn the most new things according to, uh, to some metric. Now, this is what uh, they typically, what the trajectories typically looked like. And we thought that maybe 
if we put STL preferences on top of it, we can get some sort of cleaner uh, or uh, better looking trajectories. We did not, uh, we just started experimenting and gave STL formula to keep uh, the, keep the distance to obstacles at least one meter because the obstacles, the walls is where the interesting stuff is happening. So that, that's why we wanted to keep it close to the walls. And what you see here is what started coming out after we equipped AEP with this RT star with STL. So the, the trajectories indeed started looking a little bit cleaner. And what you see here, this, this little tail going into the center of the room, that's when the constraint got relaxed. The spatial uh, aspect did not matter that much. And, uh, and we started violating the spatial robustness deliberately. Now, um, we implemented this in, a, in a, an empty room on the UAV. Uh, and what you will see is that uh, indeed it, uh, it uh, just did what I, what I indicated, uh, explore the room in some systematic way. The nice thing was that we got higher coverage rate in shorter time. And a similar thing happened in a crowded office. Uh, this is uh, this, um, uh, an environment where we also do the UAV. And you see that um, with our approach, it actually, uh, the, the UAV actually found this little nook and went into the cage, whereas without, it uh, did not. So again, we achieved higher coverage and the, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and the faster than without using this STL guidance. Okay, uh, maybe one last uh, slide on the results here is that uh, when we looked at AEP with bounding radius, you can imagine that you inflate your obstacles with 0 0.75. This is what, uh, what you would be getting. Um, so here the UAV just does not go through this door because, uh, because the obstacles are inflated so much that uh, it just considered it as closed. So we relaxed this in classical AEP and went with, uh, with bounding radius 0 0.4. And in this case, it found the door, but uh, this point here, that's where the UAV crashed. And we repeated these simulations a bunch of times and every single time it just crashed because the 0 0.4 was not enough to account for the for the imprecisions in our control. So we took STL AEP, we used the radius 0 0.4, but we also equipped it with preferences to stay at least 1.2 and at most uh, three meters away from, from the walls. And what you can see is that the exploration did quite well. Uh, we got good coverage. And uh, you can also see that, that the UAV is sort of going through when it goes through a narrow space it sort of goes in the middle and that's the effect of violating um, the spatial constraints from both sides of the door so uh, so uh, without explicit, explicitly having to encode that we want to go through the middle of the door without having to play uh, with the, how much we should inflate obstacles this STL gave us uh, this performance so another place where we started playing with STL and, and encoding preferences in STL was uh, in encoding preferred driving styles in STL. So here we see an ego vehicle that could go by uh, four different trajectories here uh, around the roadworks. And the question is, which one should it go? Some people would probably prefer the more aggressive driving and some people were would prefer the more, more uh, defensive driving and we were wondering whether we can use STL to encode um, a driving style. So we use this parameterized quantitative semantics with the A and alpha parameters uh, as, a, as a finer specification language for trajectories here. 
and we looked into evaluation whether this parameter calibration really leads to different uh, trajectories, to different perception of driving styles. What we did is uh, we encoded responsibility sensitive safety in STL. We are not the first one who have done it, so you can also see some work by George Feinekos, uh, who were the first one to do it, but we uh, had to do it again uh, to, uh, to account for our fragment that we can dealt with, the safety fragment. And uh, after we have them uh, encoded, we use different parameterization of those A's and alphas to generate a variety of trajectories. And some of them look like this, exactly where the car stops and lets the uh, red one on the roundabout go. Some of, some of them uh, uh, would wait a little bit longer, some of them would cut. And then we gave each of them a defensiveness score. So this is based on paper from Anka Dragon's group. Uh, we took a bunch of features like uh, mean, mean distance to lead vehicle, mean time, uh, headway, time to stop, and so on and so on. And these features gave it a defensiveness score. And then we went on Amazon Mechanical Torque and asked people, uh, how do you rate this behaviors, uh, this behaviors, uh, uh, this car's behavior? Is it extremely defensive or is it extremely aggressive to you? And which one would you, would you prefer uh, out of these two? Uh, now, what we saw is that the defensiveness score that was computed uh, based on those features compared to participants' ratings of this was perceived as aggressive, this was perceived as, as neutral, and this was perceived as, as, as defensive aligned very well. And we also saw, uh, which was interesting, that uh, drivers that reported themselves as conservative drivers preferred more defensive driving styles. So the question that we are currently working on is automatic generation of trajectories with desired level of aggressiveness uh, so that they not only satisfy the road rules, but also are perceived well by people that are perceived as those are the, uh, those are the ones that I wanted. Besides being effective and efficient, they are also socially acceptable. Uh, and we are also looking uh, in this line of work on inferring uh, STL representations from sets of uh, robot trajectories in human robot encounters uh, to be able to uh, extend this idea to um, more general settings, not only in autonomous driving, but uh, with robots interacting in pe with people, for instance, in office-like environments. So that's our exploratory uh, expeditions project on correct by design and socially acceptable autonomy. Now, the last part of my talk, I would like to talk about what you do when you have no plan and uncertainty on top. So, so far, everything was, uh, was nice and neat. We did not really account on, on uncertainty uh, so much. We only looked into systems that I know the environment and, and I can control well. Uh, but uh, many, many, in many cases in the real world, you will have uncertainty. So for instance, here you are uh, uncertainty in measurements, whether the, the vehicle three is in the right lane or left lane or whether it's um, where it's heading and so on. So if I have a system like this and I have an objective that is either uh, some, some sort of common sense or RSS uh, responsibility sensitive safety uh, rule, such as to keep a safe distance. I would still like to use my formal methods of framework to take a model and abstraction and then take a temporal logic specification that corresponds to this uh, common sense or, or RSS uh, safe distance. And then the formal synthesis spits out a plan that is as correct as possible. But in this case, as correct as possible, does not take into account just the severity of violation or, um, or the level of violation, but it also needs to take account what's the probability of violation and the level of uncertainty. So the higher 
the probability of violation, the the um, higher risk you should you should see that uh, associated with a plan, and the higher the level of uncertainty, the more risky the plan should be should be um, also um, assessed. So we proposed um, to take a look at risk aware planning. Our safety specification in this case is going to be again some kind of safety STL. In this case, uh, when I uh, I can, for instance, take the distance, uh, the safe distance between the ego vehicle and the leading vehicle, and uh, then I take a look at the distance that at the actual distance between. The, the difference between the position of the leading vehicle and the position of the ego vehicle. And when I look at those, I can define a severity function. Um, and that will be very similar to what we saw in spatial robustness of STL. So for instance, if, uh, if, my, uh, if my safe distance uh, is uh, this gray part, and that's, that's my ego vehicle there, and my leading vehicle is far ahead, further than the safe distance, then my severity function will tell me zero. There is uh, no violation of the desired safety specification, so you are all good. But when it's going to be closer than the um, safety specification and the safe distance, the severity of violation will be measured as a function of that uh, distance that you are missing to be safe of that red part that I have there. Uh, and then uh, since uh, that this hat X um, is a multivariate, uh, is a random variable with a multivariate Gaussian distribution that represents the state estimate, my severity of violation is actually a random variable. And um, I will measure my risk as expected severity of violation to take into account also the probabilities uh, and the uncertainty. So uh, we can take a look at a, um, a quick look at an example. Here I have a scenario from the US 101 highway data set. And the yellow vehicle needs to keep a safe distance to vehicles ahead. And uh, uh, assuming that the, the, the state estimations are uncertain, we can come up with this. Uh, we can come with this probability density function uh, of the severity of, of uh, violations of the RSS distance. So now this is most likely to be the leading vehicle, and that that uh, corresponds to my spike there. But these two also are leading vehicles with certain probability to the yellow one, and it should be accounted for uh, in my risk measure. That is why we go with uh, expected uh, severity, L, and not with, uh, with uh, measures such as uh, value at risk or conditional value at risk, because those look uh, primarily just at the tail, whereas I need to take a look at the whole probability distribution. So here I have just a small example how, how the uh, risk uh, evolves for vehicles. You can take a look at, uh, at the rightmost top vehicle, for instance, and you can see that as it starts kind of like nosing into the neighboring, um, neighboring lanes, the leading vehicle, uh, the probability of who is the leading vehicle changes and the risk starts, uh, uh, starts uh, the expected risk starts growing. Okay. Um, well, since we have the risk measure, we are able to come up with risk-aware motion planning. We did it with, uh, again, sampling-based motion planning algorithms. And these are 80 trajectories. Uh, the darker the color, the greater the risk. And these are the, the, this is, in the bottom, you see the risk evolution over time. And the big spike there is uh, precisely when the vehicle, the ego vehicle, which is now this, this blue one where all the trajectories originate, when it changes the lane and the probability uh, that this guy becomes a leading vehicle uh, starts uh, dominating. 
So <clears throat> finally, we can take a look at uh, how it looked like with respect to human driven trajectory. So you may object, of course, you can decrease your risk if you just start going slower, because when you start going slower, then the distance that you need to break is going to be uh, is going to be smaller and so on. Uh, so when we compare this to human driven trajectories, so some of our trajectories were, of course, um, decrease the risk at the at the cost of decreasing the velocity. But we also saw the other extremes. Uh, we would uh, we would decrease the vo the velocity, but the risk would increase. And uh, this this one particular trajectory that was uh that was synthesized compared to human driven trajectory was uh lower in risk but faster and it was achieved by changing the lane sooner so you can see that in the bottom uh the one that changed the lane sooner was the one that was generated by our risk aware motion planner as opposed to the uh, to the other one that was the human driven trajectory okay so uh, we are, of course, uh, working on uh, on this topic um, even more. And we are also looking into risk aware planning in environments with unknown hazards. And there, uh, the metrics uh, like value at risk and conditional value at risk became handy to us. But uh, more on that some other time. Uh, if you did not get any of the math today, uh, this is the takeaway that I would like to, you to take home. Uh, so temporal logics and formal synthesis are great to address provably correct motion planning with complex specification and constraints, and they are rigorous. Uh, there is a reason why the motion planning works that way, why it's provably correct, and, uh, and the specifications are rigorous, they are not ambiguous or anything. But at the same time, uh, temporal logics and formal synthesis are not rigid. You can use them not only for provably correct motion planning, you can use them also to preferred motion, uh, to, to, to describe preferred motion planning, to synthesize preferred motion plans, and not just in safety and mission critical uh, goals. So the semantics uh, goes uh, beyond. And then uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, of course, thanks to my group, uh, my amazing group who has done a lot of these things uh, and uh, the funding bodies that are willing to contribute to our research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jana, for the talk. Um, very interesting. Are there any questions from the audience? If yes, you can unmute yourself and, and ask directly. I have a couple of... Uh, Colin, hi, hey! Hi. <laughs> yes, you there. Uh, Jana, just two, two quick clarification questions, mm -hmm. which because maybe because I joined late. Mm -hmm. So at some point you're talking about implementing STL preferences in AEP. Yeah. How, how do you do that, just in a couple of words? Uh, how did we do that? Yeah. <clears throat> So AEP, Autonomous Exploration Planner, um, you try to go with your RT star to a point where you get uh, a, a lot of information gain. So that RT star that brings you that, there, we constrain by the STL uh, and we just try to, um, does it make and, sense? And how do you do that? Do you use the robustness of STL somehow? Or? We use robustness of STL. So here's the thing. We use only safety fragment of STL for now. Uh -huh. So by, by having the safety fragment, you do not need to take a look at the whole trajectory to, to have the, have the um, spatial robustness. You can look at a, every single point and, and get the spatial robustness from that. So similarly, as we did minimum violation RT star with LTL and with this um, this uh, you know level of violation semantics, we did it with STL. It's a uh, it's very uh, similar thing. Okay. And just one more question, then I'm uh, on slide thirty six. You say something that there is no plan uh, uh, in uncertainty, but you still have STL spec. So why? Um, why can't you put the plan somehow in the STL spec? What is the STL spec referring to? There is no plan. Um, 
Okay. Uh, that's probably not a fortunate formulation. So uh, that's that's not a plan that would satisfy the STL uh, formula with positive robustness, but with negative robustness. So, you know, STL, when you take a look at robustness, you can still say STL formula is satisfied or is not satisfied where your robustness is positive or negative. So no plan as in no plan that has positive robustness. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, if I may. Um, so I noticed that in one of your slides, you were talking about uh, there was some time uh, constraint. And then you say that, you know, if it's something less than is non-negotiable, right? And you attached a cost of uh, infinity mm -hmm. to that violation. Yeah. So what does it mean? <laughs> um, yeah, so that means that, okay. <laughs> Uh, so imagine that uh, that uh, that basically that the cost of infinity basically would mean something like, for instance, hitting hitting an obstacle or hitting a right, pedestrian right. or something. Yeah. So, but but then you know, it's like it becomes a notion of okay, so something is non-negotiable, so I have no plan and things like that right. But um, yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know, the thing is that when you're driving a car, right? So you cannot say, well, I have no plan, right? So you have to do something. Uh, you cannot wish yourself out of existence or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so um, uh, how do you think of you know that that symbol infinity you know I know um, that's how do you a, it into an action right? right that's a tough question but I think that even in in driving then uh, it may happen that anything that you do is going to be like infinitely bad you know the um right 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 but um but, yeah. among all those infinitely bad things probably there are some things that are infinitely you know yeah <laughs> they're infinitely bad they're still better than others right so um i mean in, in a sense you know this mm. whole work that we started doing right um and by the way for the record uh you know Colleen, right so you've been seeing a lot of these things that we've been doing at, uh, you know, it all started with Yana, right, many years ago. Um, and um, many, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think that, you know, really the, the main objective was to avoid this notion of invisibility, right? So this notion of saying that there are some situations which I don't know what to do. I always need to know what to do, even though mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is very, very bad, right? But in a sense, I always want to have some control over the choice, right? So, um, you know, that's why yeah, I was wondering, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what that that what does that infinite infinity symbol really mean, right? So, uh, you know, I think that for me personally, this goes all the way to like uh, the trolley problem. If I have two infinitely bad choices, what should I do? Then uh, I I don't know. It's for me. This is a discussion that goes all the way to ethics of of driving. And for me, infinity there is. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to think about it. It's so bad. I'm on my day grade. To, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, so so it's of course this is extreme uh, thing. This is something that. Is precisely what we want to avoid with this um, with this minimum violation planning. Uh, but uh, of course, it happens from time to time that whatever you do is infinitely bad, and then yeah, you see. But you know, so that's the thing, right? So mm -hmm. the, you know, this this happens from time to time. What I've seen is that these things that happen from time to time actually happen way too frequently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so, or, or, you know, th this has been my experience, you know, when we're, you know, starting to drive with the cars and things mm -hmm. like that. A lot of things that you think that will never happen, actually, they do happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's why, I mean, for me, it's kind of important to try to figure out what to do, even in cases in which, you know, you don't really have what you would call a good solution. I get that, but we didn't yeah. go yeah. that way. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I don't want to monopolize all your time. So I don't know if somebody answers other questions. Those are interesting discussions. Is there any other question? Don't be shy. I actually have one which is a bit related to what Emilio just asked. Uh, and uh, and it's about, uh, I think there was a good picture uh, that illustrates this question. And it's the one in which you had, uh, I think it was a slide 30, which you had these many different trajectories and you wanted to rank mm -hmm. them somehow. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then you, you, you explained how you uh, encode different driving styles into different cost functions. Mm -hmm. by essentially merging single costs into a yeah. big one and assigning some weights to these, uh, these uh, sub-costs. Um, my question, first question was, how do you exactly choose these weights? So is there mm -hmm. a formal way to do that? And second, uh, have you thought about uh, including some hierarchies uh, instead of putting everything into a single preference? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more about the works, for instance, that uh, Emilio was referring to before. Is yeah. Works, for instance. Uh huh. Um, so, for the first question, so far we don't have any systematic way to uh, to choose the parameters. We just played around at empirically, and uh, you know, it just started clustering essentially. Uh, so that uh, there is no systematic way so far uh, from our end to do this. Um, and when it comes to hierarchies, I think that this is quite possible because when you when you think about it, this is just RT star with uh, with now not with uh, the LTL semantics, but with STL semantics, you can you can basically do the same thing. It's instead of just uh, having a J function, you will have a you will have an ordering of the J functions, and then you will you will uh, do with the hierarchies and priorities as, as you need. So I think that that, that extension is um, possible quite easily, yeah. That's very interesting. It's something we're thinking about and it's great to hear that it's not completely out of, <laughs> out of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any final question for Jana? I think you left the contact in case people want to reach out for deeper uh, questions. Yeah, I, I will write it in chat. Just feel free to reach out if you want to. Thank you very much. It has been Yana, a great yeah, Jana, can I also add, is there any way you can actually send the links to the papers to uh, that you based your talk on if they're available? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can definitely. References and then we're going to find them, but if we can, we can have the list of references. Uh, did I? Did I put it in the slide? Should oh, I, just, the slide can, the slide I can, I can send just the slide deck and there is there's always the first author's name and, and the venue and the year, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be. Yeah, and the video will be posted online today, later today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you very much, Jan, again for the Thank great you. talk. And good Thank luck you. for the next projects. Thanks so much. Yeah. And it was great having you. It was great being here. And nice seeing you, Emilio and Colleen and everyone. <laughs> hey, nice to see you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.